One of the easiest ways to take a conversation from friendly to antagonistic is to begin to talk about government. If you listen to the news, that's virtually all we hear. And for some, government is evil, oppressive, and the epitome of all things evil. In other words, the government is behind all bad things. And for some, all things. For some, the government was behind the 9-11 Twin Towers attack. The government is intent on taking away all of our rights. The government is intent on turning our country into a socialist state. That is, every last one of the 23.7 million people that work in civil service, in every federal, state, county, city government, every postman, every policeman, every firefighter, every soldier, every clerk, behind every desk is intent on turning all 27 point, 23.7 million of them is intent on turning our country into a socialist state. The government is behind everything and especially bad stuff. For others, for others, the government is the answer. And the more government, the better. Supplying the needs of the people, solving all the problems of the masses, and becoming a big brother, a big mother, and a big father all rolled into one. So if you want to start a fight, just start talking about government. Yet we do need to talk about government. Yes, it may start an argument, and yes, it is a very frustrating topic. We may not like the government, we may not trust the government. You know, the most terrifying nine word phrase that you could hear is, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. So, so even though it's terrifying, we do need to talk about government. We may easily view the government as the least trustworthy, least efficient, least effective entity around. And yet, godly government is one of the fundamental truths. Why is that? Well, there's a scripture that gives government, I think very simply, this level of importance. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, and we'll begin reading in verse 6. For unto us a child is born. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government, there we go again, twice in this section, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Government is important, but let me, let me qualify that and then ask a question that will, will frame my sermon. Let me put it differently. Godly government is important. And so the question is, what is God's mind on government? And the title then for the message today is simply Godly Government. I think that, that should make sense. So first, what are we talking about? What are we talking about here? You see, because the, the reality is, is that government means something different to different people. Let's say, for example, when you think of government, what do you think about? Um, the president? The Congress, the IRS, the FBI, the CIA, the MIB, Men in Black. What, what, what do you think about when you think, when we think about government, what, what picture comes into our mind? Now, if you go back to Romans chapter 13, let's go to Rom Romans chapter 13. And we read a statement here by Paul talking to an audience that was in a very different time and place. I mean, they, they didn't even know about the CIA back then, they were, but they were in a time and place. And we read Romans chapter 13 and verse one, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So plainly, Paul, Paul said to the church at Rome, you need to be, subject to authorities, but when he said that, 
the, what they were thinking was not what we're thinking today. They didn't live in our world today. They lived in a very different world. So what did government mean to them? What would government mean to someone who is in Rome during the first century? What would that mean to their, their, their livelihood, their, their freedoms, their daily life? Certainly it'd be different from today, wouldn't you say? If they were transported somehow to our time and we were transported back to their time, what we would think, what we'd see in terms of government would be, would be different, right? How about, let's say, for example, under the Assyrian or Babylonian domination of, of Israel and then Judah as they were being dragged into captivity. I guarantee you government would mean something different to them than it means to us today. I imagine we would not be very pleased with our rights and with our ability to be able to uh, you know, have our, our freedoms in a time like that when they were under the shoe of a dominating power. How about in the Bible again, 1 Samuel chapter 8, we want to go to a scripture. 1 Samuel chapter 8. And we read during the time of Samuel how the people wanted a different government because what government meant to them was not something they liked. We see chapter 8 and verse 1 of 1 Samuel. It came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel and the name of his second, Abijah. And they were judges in Beersheba, but his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. So I say the government they, that these people experienced, at least under the, in, in terms of what we're reading about here and these leaders, was, was not a very pleasant experience. And so that's what they knew of as government. So when you ask about government, they would certainly complain about the bribes and the perverted justice. So they had a perspective of government that was unique to their time, obviously. How about, how about Judges chapter 21? If we go back further, Judges 21, and we read Judges 21 and verse 25, the last, book of, the last verse of the book of Judges. In those days, there was no king in Israel, Everyone did what is, was right in his own eyes. It was chaos. And so when people, in terms of government, what they experienced in terms of government, again, very different than us, there would be, let's say, very little, or perhaps it was uh, survival of the fittest. We, we can begin to deduce, we, look, we read about that time, what it was like, but it wasn't a domineering king, but almost more like likely sort of, uh, you know, warlords in the sense of what some countries experience today, where the power in different places, wherever you lived, was going to dominate your life. Regardless, it was different than it is today. And, and one last example, let's go to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, the, the, I'll say the governing powers, if you want to use a, a specific term here, the governing powers in this day were certainly cruel and wicked and evil. And so what a person would experience in terms of the governing powers over them, the authorities over them, we find described here in verse five, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. How people think of government would have been different in all these situations. And, and what you and I think about government, like it or not, is, is colored by our own personal experience. And that would be the case even today in different parts of the world, wherever you would go. For example, the students just, just came back from Thailand. Thailand is, is a, is, it's a constitutional monarchy. So if the if the Congress puts a law, uh, writes a law into a, uh, as, as on the books, within 30 days, if it's not made in, if the king does not sign it, it becomes law anyway. So that's a specific of that government. That's different from, let's say, our country. How about other places like Myanmar, or like in South Africa, or like in Ukraine, or in Germany? Or, in other words, I think you get the point that even today. What people think about government, what comes to mind is based on different experiences because we're all different. And if we take that, that and go back in time, again, government means something different to, to everybody. But how did government start? What is government in its most simplified form? Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 9. 
Because we have some clues here. Isaiah chapter 9. And we read verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. We read this earlier, and then we read in verse 7, Of his increase, of, of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. So we read this Hebrew, this word that's translated into our language, into our English language, uh, government. And if you just do a little bit of a word study on it, you'll see that the, the Hebrew word is, is misra. That's the way it's translated, transliterated. It, it, M-I-S-R-A-H would be the English transliteration. And it's from a root, interestingly, sara. It's from a root that's, that's enunciated sara. And, and sara has, has a couple interesting meanings to it. And it has, um, it depends on the nuance. But here's what the, the basic definition breaks down into. Firstly, sara has to do with setting things in a row, in order, placing things in, in order, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or, ordering or organizing something. And then it has a second part to it as well that, that intertwines, and that is it has a sense of, of a leader doing that or a sense of authority. So it's, it's, it's a two-part word, and there's another nuance as well, but, but it, it has to do with it. But clear, basically, it's a two-part uh, uh, meaning to place in a row or to set in order or to be a leader who does that as, as an authority figure. So let's expand that thought because this is a clue that helps us to discern God's mind on order. And let's go back to Genesis chapter one to do so. Genesis chapter one, when we are introduced in this book that has been inspired for us and given to us, we see that God, as he began to work with everything that is, we see something very interesting. Verse one, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and then the earth was or became without form and void and so on. Verse three, and then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And he called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. So what was the very first thing we read about as far as his recreation in way of earth? What, what was it? It was a setting in order, right? Day and night. Now that pattern continues, doesn't it? Because we continue reading verse six, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. So he made the firmament, this atmosphere, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, so the evening and the morning were the second day. So roughly speaking, he divided this amazing substance we had, this H2O, into gas, liquid, and we also recognize a frozen type. We have, in other words, the, the atmosphere that we, in which we live and breathe and function is organized in such a way that we can actually be able to live and breathe and function, right? You go into the water and you can't, at least for us, we can't live and breathe and function very well. It's made for us to be able to walk around and we don't even realize it, but we're actually, we're experiencing the atmosphere that was established all the way back, back here. Then God said, verse nine, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And so a continuation of that, establishing the dry land and so on. Verse 11, then God said, let the earth bring forth grass and the herb that yields seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth and it was so. So we read about plants and amazingly plants are, are organized so that they reproduce after their kind. So if you plant a tomato seed, you're not going to surprisingly get a pumpkin or especially not an eggplant because I don't like eggplant. And so if I put a, you know, if it was just a 50-50 chance that you might, whatever, you put a tomato seed in there and you might get an eggplant, you might get a pumpkin, you might get a squash, I can put up with squash, but not eggplant. If you put, but you never know what's going to come out because it's not organized. It's all just whatever but that's not the way it works. Imagine our whole system of all the plants 
that we interact with on a daily basis is all very organized, isn't it? It's all established by laws that govern not only the existence of the atmosphere, not only the day and the night, but all the plants, everything that we interact with. But it doesn't end there, does it? And you know, we could go on a long time with this, right? Because as we go through the creation, we read that it's a story, it's, a, it's an account of God's organization, or you might say laws, that established everything around us. We read here, it says, verse uh, 14, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And so we have the heavens are organized in such a way that we can actually, I can't, but you know, seafarers of old uh, could be able to f know where they were going based on the stars. And, and you can go out at night, I can do this, and look at the Big Dipper and see how the heavens circle around the North Star. And you, you know, if you can find the North Star, you know which way North is. So we can organize, you know, we, we know where to go because, why? Because God's organized the host of the heavens. And he's organized the seasons and the passing of, of time. I hope I'm not belaboring the point to see that a God, he's really a God of organization, isn't he? He's a God that, that organizes establishes, you could use the term laws. Even when we come to the animals, where we read about the waters abounding with an abundance of living creatures and birds flying above the earth across the face of the firmament, verse 20, the heavens, the sea creatures, and then all the animals that are created. We read of all these different animals. And so we know that when it comes to not only plants, but insects, for example, uh, bees are organized in a certain way. I used to have some beehives and I would love to sit and watch how the bees would all come in and they'd land on the landing board and they'd do a little dance and then other bees would fly off because they knew now where to get the, you know, the, the, the nectar because of the little dance that was done. I don't know what it means, but it was pretty neat to watch. And you see how they're all organized and you can open it up and you see all the, the, the drones and how the queen is cared for. And it's, it's a whole, it's like a little universe inside this, inside this super, this, uh, this box of, uh, uh, of, your, of the different frames and so on. But it doesn't end with just the plants because animals, you know, animals are organized into herds. If you've got deer or buffalo out where the, where the buffalo roam and, and, herds of antelope where they where they play and and so you've got all, you've got animals organized in different groups chickens they always organize themselves in flocks have you noticed that they don't organize themselves in in mischiefs do you know what a mischief is some of you probably know because you know your trivia what do you call a group of rats a mischief that's what they're called actually if you don't learn anything else today, you can take that little bit of that piece home with you. <laughs> so, so rats, when there's a bunch of them, I thought it was really fascinating. Sorry. I really thought that, that you would, I put a lot of research into this. I looked it up on Google because I had heard one time that rats had a funny name for their organization and I found it. It was a mischief. So there you go. But Fish are in schools. Chickens are in flocks. The birds and the animal, antelopes are in herds. And rats are in mischiefs, but it's, they're all organized that way, and it all, it all works together. But before we leave this thought about how we see early on in the Bible, we see God's penchant for organization and laws that would then guide that organization, we see something different. We're hit with a, a bit of a out-of-left-field uh, observation here. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. So we see verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and to keep it, organize it, m maintain it, right? So, so it could pr then prosper under his hand. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for the, in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. Now, you know what happened because you've read ahead in the story and you know that Adam and Eve did not follow this guide. So we see something different because you see any of the fish that are swimming around in the ocean, they don't break away and say, I'm not going to swim in a school. 
I want to be in a mischief, you know, and you don't have antelopes, whatever. You understand the point. Man is different. Of all God's creation, man is different because man has free moral agency. You see, so, so government is different with mankind because decision-making is involved. In Genesis chapter 3, we read the story of mankind throwing off godly government. In other words, the organizational pattern that God had established, which says, don't eat from this tree, eat from these trees, care for this. Man had made the decision to say, no, thank you, I want to do it differently. Because man has the capacity for free moral agency and to do it different. So when, so when government is concerned, mankind is, is unique. The plants, the animals, the elements of the earth, even the planets and the galaxies function naturally within the government established by God. Gravity never defies itself, it just works. But for man, he has to choose to accept government, godly government. The, the animals, the plants, elements of our universe, they accept the organizational system as a matter of reality. But you see, God, as we read the scriptures, God says to mankind, in fact, he says right here in, in chapter two, he, he, he says, this is my organizational system. Every seventh day, you honor the, the Sabbath day towards me. You keep this day special. He says, don't hurt your neighbor. And we read in chapter four about how that is defied. We read, don't take what your neighbor has worked for. Don't steal from your neighbor. In other words, God establishes an organizational system and mankind has to choose to, to submit to it because of the nature of, of man. And God's system of, of organization for successful human life then requires the making of choices. It's not instinct. And as I said, you might also call it, in addition to his organizational system, his law. So when we read in Isaiah chapter 9 that God's government will increase with no end, we're reading about the establishment of godly order, a godly organizational system upon the earth. But remember, the, the word underpinning godly government in Isaiah chapter 9 has another component I mentioned, and that is authority. Authority. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. See, because not only does God, when, when this, this word government that gives us clues about what godly government is about, because it's the, it's, it's the word that's used to, to, to show Christ's ever-expanding government, well, there's another part to it, and it, it's a mechanism, you might say, for action. And that mechanism is authority. Ephesians chapter 1 And we read here in verse, uh, let's begin here, how should we begin? Let's, let's begin in verse, um, verse 19, well, verse 18. I'm breaking into the thought here. By the time we get to it, I probably could have read the previous two verses, but it will just start here in verse, in verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. I'm going here because it's a place that emphasizes who that authority is above all else. And there are many places we can go in the Bible, but that's why I'm pointing to this, because it, it, it emphasizes who that authority ultimately is. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, verse 19, now verse 20, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So we see that also part of government is, is this authority or a king or a leader that executes, that teaches, that, that puts into practice 
the, or, the system of order. That's what godly government is about. Godly government is not about laws without authority, and it's not about authority without laws. It's, it's actually this combination of both. With animals and plants, again, it's instinct, it's survival. Who decides the rules? You know, is it the, the lead horse, the stallion that says which way to run? You know, or is it uh, the mama bear that says we'll take the, the, the cubs this way? Or is it uh, lions or wolves? Uh, it's by the, you know, the, the strongest lion that can fend off all attackers, and he's the boss. Interestingly, when we think about some of the different potential types of authority, we see shadows of those in godly, go I mean, in mankind's government, don't we? Because we see unlimited power. We see peer pressure and movement. I, I say even with, let's say, horses, they're, they're driven by fear. It's a, it's a, it's a flight mechanism. And you, so they, they, they run together or, or cows do the same thing. But, you, but the, 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 the ways that animals function, sometimes we find in human function as, as well, in terms of authority. But what we see that God says is that there is one who is ultimately in authority, and that is God. And Jesus Christ, who decides the rules, you might say. And when, since mankind rebelled against God as that authority, he has tried just about everything, from strength and power to survival of the fittest, to popularity-based systems, which we are experiencing today. And that's the, you know, the sad fact as we watch government today is we see, we, we, we see why it is not sustainable. Because ultimately today, our system of government, sad to say, is, a, is about the self. Yet there is authority and there is, there is law. If we're to take on the mind of God on government, then we'll accept God as our ultimate authority and we'll accept his instruction on ordering our lives and, um, and we'll accept him as our ultimate authority. I wanna read a quote from a, uh, the booklet, Do You Believe the True Gospel by Dr. Meredith because he talks about this as the future when he points towards the future when Christ rules on this earth. He says, at the time of Christ's second coming, loud voices in heaven will proclaim the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Thus will tomorrow's world finally be inaugurated. Daniel's prophecy, when studied with the book of Revelation, should make it abundantly clear that the future kingdom of God will be a literal government, just as was previously mentioned, uh, as were the previously mentioned world ruling empires. As Daniel concluded, the dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. This is gloriously wonderful good news. Other Old Testament prophets also clearly show that Christ's kingdom will be a future divine government having global administrative authority over this earth. The thing is, we get to learn and understand godly government today. We don't have to wait for the future because God's opened our mind to look to the scriptures and to understand the scriptures. So explain about government being two-part uh, order, laws, and, and, and authority that both have to work together. But what's fascinating is if we go back to Genesis chapter two, is we learn that God has given us a workshop in which to learn about godly government, a, mi a mind of God in terms of government. You see, we have a chance to test drive, and this is the, you might say, the application of what I've been talking about. We have a chance to test drive this system, and we have a chance to experience it ahead of time, ahead of the rest of the world, when all the world will, will experience the blessing of godly government. So I talked about how important government is to God, and, and to show you how much God is a God of today, and God is a God of detail, we're gonna look at the mechanism, or the workshop, or the sandbox, whatever you wanna call it, that God gave us to learn about how it works and put it into practice. So Genesis chapter two, we read verse 15. We're gonna come down to verse 23 now, rather verse uh, 20, 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept and he took one of its ribs, his ribs and closed up the flesh in his place. 
Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. And to Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man. In verse 25, we read of the establishment, you might say of the family. Verse 24 then, I, I'm sorry, did I say 25? Verse 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So we see not only did step number one, God give mankind the opportunity to exercise authority in the garden, but now he created this thing called a family, husband and wife, where they also learn to practice godly laws as well as, as well as authority. And you can see here verse, in fact, I should back up and just emphasize um, verse, uh, let's see here, verse, verse 28 of chapter one, that that really began even in terms of man learning to exercise authority began with this creation that God has made. Because we see here in verse 28, after he created man in his own image and male and female, verse 27, he created them. It says, then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. So he mentions this concept of having authority, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So he, he mentions that and then he brings them into this unit, this family this family unit. I think what's interesting is when we look at what comes next, we see that Satan, the devil, who is antagonistic to God on every front, including proper government, what did he do? He actually tried to undermine the, the, the very, the workshop, the place where understanding a godly way of doing things and understanding right authority and accepting that authority, all that, that place was attacked right from the get-go. And that's what we read about here in chapter three, when God sought to, and when Satan sought to insert himself into the family. We find that a couple of things are mentioned here. For example, we find <clears throat> verse, um, verse, let's see here, verse, I want to go back to, um, oh, you know what I want to do actually at this point? I want to go forward to, um, Genesis, to Exodus chapter 20. That's what I want to do. Let's go to Exodus chapter 20. Because in Exodus chapter 20, we find that the, some of the, 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 the guidelines that are to be practiced within the family then are brought up here in a, a codified form. We see Exodus chapter 20, for example, and we read in verse, in verse eight, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And then we read six days, you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it, you shall do no work. But then we add the component that comes with the family, don't we? Because it says, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So we see that, that God, in terms of, of, of teaching about his way of functioning, we find that the way to learn about the Sabbath was first and foremost through the family that a father is to teach his children about the Sabbath day. And a father is to, along with the mother, they are to coach their children in terms of the Sabbath day. So the first place to learn about God's plan for the week, for real life, is within the family. We see, as we go on, we see a couple of other um, issues here. Verse 12. Honor your father and your mother, mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. So in other words, we find honor and respect and again, understanding authority and deference. Where is it to be taught? How is it to be, how, how is it to be, what, what's the template or what's the, the mechanism that's to be used? It is the respect for father and mother. 
and that is to be taught to the children. And as a result, we see that there'll be, there'll be long life. And I, I think that there's more to it than simply just individual long life. Obviously, if we, if we ab abide by wise principles, we can avoid um, things that are going to terminate our life earlier. But there's, a, there's another, if you go to De Deuteronomy chapter five, there's another facet to this as well that we see is brought out in Deuteronomy chapter five. Deuteronomy chapter five, and we see here in verse 33, Here, after the reiteration of the, of the commandments, we see verse 32. Therefore, you shall be careful to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live and that it may be well with you and that you may prolong your days in the land which you shall possess. I think there's a, a bigger picture in terms of honoring father and mother when people look to, when the next generation looks to the wisdom of the past generation, and there's deference and there's respect, it produces an atmosphere in the land that's very different from that of antagonism and that of disrespect and dishonor and a disregard for authority that sows anarchy in the, in the, in the culture. And a culture that is filled with, with anarchy and antagonism and rebellion is going to, to rot from the inside. But where, do the, where are these things taught and where are these things learned within the family? Let's go back to Exodus 20 again. And we learn here in verse, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 13, you shall not murder. So he, God's, God's actually teaching them instructions, but where, where, what's the first opportunity to teach children against or teach a person that... We do, we're not hateful and we don't hurt other people. What's the first possible time that that can be learned for us as an individual? Is it not as children? So when we have children, we should be teaching them not to be hateful. And as we do, we're actually teaching them within the framework of the order that God has given that creates harmony in a society. You shall not bear false witness. Well, you should not, come, I should back up verse 14. You shall not commit adultery. Likewise, where does a proper male-female re relationship, where is it taught to people, to us as humans? What's the first, what, where, is, where are the patterns laid that will be then established for the rest of the life? They're taught within the family. So, what I'm taught, what I'm saying is, look, the, even the Ten Commandments, what we, when we read the Ten Commandments, we recognize, okay, these are, this is part of the system of ordering that God has given to mankind, and the family is the best place and the first place where those should be learned. God has given that opportunity for us to practice those within the family. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And we read that this is by design. Ephesians chapter five, familiar section here, but here we read about how Paul establishes marriage as a learning institution. And I mean that in the best possible way as an institution. Okay, marriage is a place where we can, we, we can learn what it's like to love another person. We learn what it's like to be under authority. We learn what it's like to actually have a, a commitment and a responsibility for another person. So we read, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife as also Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Husbands, verse 25, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So we see that our relationship, as you go down to the chapter, our relationship with Christ is actually practiced through our relationship with our husband or with our, our wife. Responsibility, care, love, patience, authority. Bearing authority properly and being under authority properly as well are all part of, of this experience of marriage and, and the family. Now, 
let's go back to, let's look at one other workshop that we're given in the scriptures. And it's the workshop that we often think about when, we, when the, the subject of government comes, comes up in the church because it's something that's very present. But I think it's, it's important. But I think we need to recognize, that, and that is church government, because church government is part of the equation. But in fact, it's, it's, it's another workshop, just like the family, for us to practice a proper godly mindset towards government. But sometimes we can mistakenly say, well, there's, there's let's say, worldly government. You know, there's the government of the world around us, and there's church government. But I say, no, that's not, a, that's not exactly right. No, there's the world's approach to government, and there's God's approach to government. And God's approach to government is just is not confined to the church. God's from God's a mindset towards government is how we think about our families, how we think about beyond beyond just church government. Yet it is a place, a workshop that we do get to practice a godly mindset towards government. And we see that begins all the way back in Genesis where we read in Genesis chapter 18 of how as God worked with a group of people in a different way than with a family, we see in Genesis chapter 18 that God worked with Abraham in order for him to teach the proper godly sense of order or law, and we see authority as part of the equation as well. I'm breaking into the thought here, but Genesis chapter 18, verse 19, God said about Abraham, I have known him in order that he may command his children, there's, his, there's the authority component, and his household after him that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice. That's a, that's a, a, a godly way of ordering the way we function in day-to-day life. It says, to do righteousness and justice that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. So we see that God's working with a group of people when what ultimately became the the church uh, setting began with Abraham and a family. And as it grew large, we come to Exodus chapter 18. Exodus chapter 18. And we see in verse, the latter part of the chapter here, verse 25, we see that as God began to work with a nation, then he instituted Government. He instituted a way of ordering things and also having authority. It says, Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over all the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. So they judged the people at all times. And the hard cases they brought to Moses, but they judged every small case to themselves. What, were the, what was the sense of ordering that they had to apply to all the cases that were brought to them? was God's law, wasn't it? And and authority played a part in it as well. We read in Acts chapter 7 that uh, the congregation, that an ancient nation of Israel is spoken of as the congregation in the wilderness. So we see this connection to, in fact, even at this very time, it's referred to at Mount Sinai, uh, but we see the connection between ancient Israel and the New Testament church. But let's continue that thread through. We read in Deuteronomy chapter 4, Deuteronomy chapter four, as God worked with Israel as a nation, we see he he acknowledges, he highlights the fact that as he works with them as a nation, they, they have the responsibility to conduct themselves according to the way that he has ordered things or his law. I hope you understand where I'm going with this, brethren. In other words, we have a choice to make on a daily basis. Do we order our lives according to the way that God orders his life? Uh, God orders, as it tells us to order our lives, or do we order it according to our own experiences? And when we, when we think about government, our, our sense of government is so colored by, by what we've experienced in our life our fascination with our right to speak up, our right to right every wrong, for example. Do we, do we think about, are we colored, is our mindset toward government colored towards the world around us? Are we able to shed that 
and completely take on the sense that godly government is about soaking our mind in the way God orders things, thoughts, every, our, our actions, our words. God orders things this way and acknowledge his authority to tell us to do it that way. Are we able to do that within our family, within our marriage, and also within our, our congregation? Because we have ample opportunity to get crossways in all those, in all those settings, don't we? Within our marriage, we have easy, ample opportunity to become frustrated, impatient, angry, embittered, upset. What do we do? Is our response based upon what we see around us, what we've grown up with, what our, our environment tells us to do? Or is our response based on the way God orders human relationships? That's the question. Because we can very easily just paper on a few of God, godly principles in our life and not totally be under his authority so that what, the way he tells us to order our thoughts, we proactively say, I want to think this way. And here's the sandbox I get to work this out in with my wife or with my husband. Do we do that? Or do we say, no, that's, that's, um, this is different. This is, don't, you, you have to understand She's mean, he's mean, whatever else. That there's, you don't understand this person, this situation. How, how, do we, how do we approach things? Because godly government permeates everything that we do. It's not just about church. You get a chance to practice it, certainly, within church. But we see here in Deuteronomy chapter 4, and we see that as God began to work with Israel, he said, look, I've taught you statutes, verse five, and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded, uh, verse five, commanded me, that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. In other words, he's saying, just like with Adam and Eve, he's saying, I have laid out the way you're supposed to function. I have ordered the way you're supposed to act. And he says, therefore, be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Their approach to life is amazing. It's Solomon-like. You know, how, Solomon how did Solomon function in such a wise way? It was because God inspired him to be able to explain to people how to order their lives and the judgments that he made in a wise way. And he says, look, if you will do these things, the people around will say, well, they will, they will yearn to, to, to model their lives and their national existence on the way you're doing things, if you will only do so. So he says, for what great nation, well, let me back up to verse six. Therefore, be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us for whatever reason we may call upon him? And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you this day. He says, you, you've been given a wonderful, beautiful way to order your life or to regulate or to legislate your, your life. Let's go to Judges chapter 21. Well, I'll just mention it because I already... I referred to it earlier, and that is what came of Israel was chaos. And we read that last verse of chapter 25 of Judges, that everyone did what was right in their own eyes. But as time went by, let's go to 1 Kings then, 1 Kings. We see that as, through David and, and, and Solomon, as they looked to God and looked to him, I mean, Solomon actually prayed to God for wisdom, for God's way of deciding what should happen and how it should happen in terms of the, the people's challenges and problems that were brought, brought before him. We see that God prospered Israel. First Kings chapter four. And we see the result of that. First Kings chapter four. And I'm going to say, 
it was, we see they prospered through godly government because they were, at that point, they were looking to God to guide them. And Solomon put himself under God and said, please guide me. I need your wisdom. I need your help. I'm like a babe. I don't know what to do. So 1 Kings chapter 4, here as we read about the, the result of that. And we see verse 25 in Judah and Israel during the reign then of, of Solomon, Judah and Israel dwelt safely, each man under his vine and his fig tree from Dan as far as Beersheba all the days of Solomon. Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. And it talks about all the provisions that came to Solomon. And verse 29, it says, And God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore. And it goes on to describe it. Let's go to the New Testament because now we come to Matthew chapter 16 and we see how the church follows this trajectory of God dealing with humans, with people. In this case, the New Testament church. And he actually speaks to Peter about this. Matthew chapter 16. where we read here as, as he's speaking to his disciples. Verse 13, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And we see Christ's comments, but then verse 16, Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, we understand he was speaking of himself. I will build my church and the gates of the grave shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Now you notice something here, the, the word keys, uh, from what I understand from um, what uh, commentaries say about this, and we find a reference even in the Old Testament to a similar word. It wasn't as if it was a, you know, a key to unlock your car. It was actually a, 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 a symbol, it was a, a small, I don't know, maybe a mini scepter, some describe it, as, as something that you carried about that showed that this individual had worked under the authority of the king. He spoke with the authority of the king. And so we understand, therefore, that this person did not have the right to change the laws of the king only to implement them. He had the authority to make judgments based on the law of the king and make decisions, which fits directly into what, we, what we've been focusing on here, where in this case, we see that he, he said to Peter, look, you have the responsibility to, to see my law is carried out, but you have the authority to do so. And, and so that was, that's the principle that's carried forward here as the New Testament church is, is established. In other words, if the church were to survive the centuries, there had to be an established pattern of law and authority that was, that was uh, embedded in it. We see that there was a lot to learn about the law, for example, and implementing the law. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So there would be a challenge to continue to, to, continue to, to teach and to preach and to lay out that system of ordering things or, or law. But he said, you should hold fast to it. He says, verse 13, we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle, speaking to the fact that there were, there were guidelines, there were instructions, the way there were, there were uh, 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 systems, there were traditions that were judgments that were made in, in maintaining that order within the laws that God established. But he says that is to be part of the, of the church. And there's the authority to, to carry it out as well. 
as we read in Ephesians chapter four. Let's go to Ephesians chapter four. And we, we all understand that the church can become a workshop for working within authority when our feelings are hurt or when we have a disagreement with another, another member or when we're offended in some way or maybe even something that we hear that we, 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 see we don't agree with. You know, what do we do then? What do we do? Do we just go off as, as on our own? Or do we actually work within the framework and we, if it's a, a friend or a neighbor or that we're, we're offended against within the church, that we go, we have a, a guideline as to how we're supposed to function and what is, what is that guideline? Well, the scriptures tell us we're supposed to go to our brother. So if we are actually under the authority of God, we're, gonna, we're not going to say, that doesn't work. You don't understand. We're going to do what the scriptures say, which is go to our brother. That's what the scriptures tell us to do and actually address them as opposed to gossiping around the whole church or in certain situations where we don't, we don't understand something or agree with something doctrinally. We go to the pastor, we go to the elder and we say, can you help me understand this? Can you explain this? And we, we do things in a manner that actually does not cre create a disharmony within the church, but actually works within a, a of, of an order that's established to maintain the harmony, which is what God establishes through his ways. Ephesians chapter four, and we see verse 11. Now we have more framework that helps carry out a godly government, authority and order. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. We see verse 11. But what's the purpose of this? It's not just to establish some, uh, some governmental system ad hoc. It's actually for the purpose of learning to work in harmony, isn't it? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ." that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. No, but if we do things properly and we look, we look towards a leadership to guide and make judgments as necessary, what does it do? It creates, it creates harmony. It creates a, a, a body that is able to function properly. But it requires, you imagine, you can't have one without the other. You can't have authority and no clear laws and guidelines upon which judgments can be made. Can you imagine that? That's not the way our government works today as well. Constantly creating laws and then striking laws so that uh, sometimes you're not even sure what law applies. You know, so you're trying to figure, we, in our day and age, we're, this is why we need people who specifically can, can be lawyers to be able to, to understand the law as it's constantly changing. I have one person I, I know well, um, was dealt with, with tax regulations for, uh, for banking and business. And, and every year he had to go to conferences to explain the new and updated laws regarding, ta regarding taxation because, and banking and so on, because they always changed. But we have a God who, who lays out a framework that's not going to be upended from year to year. So we have the opportunity here, as we said, to, to, to have an, an order that is established early and continues on through history to today and on into the future that uh, does not turn up, does not uh, become opposite one year from the other. That we should no longer, verse 14, be children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So we could... It's take a lot of time to learn more about how authority should be handled, how authority should be properly ex exercised, how it should not be done with, uh, with cruelty 
It should be done with integrity. It should be followed by example, how it, there should be mercy. And we, we can certainly learn a lot about how authority should be practiced within the church and within our families. My point today is that though it, has, it is part of a godly mindset towards government, that is authority, along with laws. So, godly government. There's a purpose for godly government. Whether it be in the family, whether it be in the community, whether it be in the church, because we can take these principles, the godly principles towards government, a proper willingness to be under authority, and also a willingness to take responsibility when necessary. Following godly laws, godly ways of doing things, a godly mindset, a godly ordering of life. We can actually apply these things in other groups within the community in which we, we interact or in our business, our employment. Now we can, we can use godly principles towards government with a boss or with an employee. We can also use godly laws like being not, not cheating, not lying, not stealing. Um, we can, so we can apply these in other scenarios. But we have ample opportunity within the church, don't we, as we interact with each other. And we have lots of opportunity within our families as well, these workshops that God has given to us. But if we will, if we will take an, a godly mindset towards government, a godly mindset towards God's law, a godly mindset towards authority, that even with are the vestiges of our own experiences that are still part of us, if we will soak our mind in, in God's thoughts, little by little, our reactions towards government will not be simply from our time listening to the radio or watching the internet or the memes or whatever else. We won't be guided. We won't be influenced by that. We'll be influenced by what's in here, by the mind of God. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5 tells us that we should let Christ's mind be in us. And this is one more area in which it's vitally important. You see, mankind has a history of too much government and not enough government. Mankind has a history of cruel government and some reasonably good governments from time to time. Mankind has a history of of government through force and violence, and mankind has a history of government through voting and balloting. But we've, we've never, as a human family, experienced the real thing, godly government, that is. But that will change. Let's go to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. There will come a time when all the governments and mankind's approach to government will, will end. They'll be destroyed. They'll be blown away like chaff. And we read about that time here in Daniel chapter 2. We read Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. The days of the, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. In this case, not like the kingdoms that have come before. That one by one are destroyed to be replaced by the next. But what we read about here is a kingdom which will never be destroyed. It will never fall. <laughs> the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. We look forward to the time when God's kingdom will be the order, and it will exercise the authority upon this earth. We hope that it will come quickly because what we see in the governments of this world are, are all, all the bad examples that mankind, whether through history or even, uh, even today, are, are the bad examples of what man can concoct. And we see the fruits, and we see the fruit of those examples born in the suffering of humanity. So 
may God's kingdom, his government come quickly. And yet may we today, as we live our lives, may we learn to live by the principles of his government. May we learn to order our lives personally, within our families, within the church, and particularly in these work areas, these workshops that we have a chance to interact with other people who are also seeking to learn and implement the mind of God. And we take advantage of this opportunity today to learn, to implement, to think like God as we do our very best to implement and learn the mind of God and godly government.